Hey folks and welcome to They Might Be Homesteading. This is our third weekend on the permaculture project and what we're doing right now is we're setting the frame for the pavers that we're going to set out here. And we put these in. These are things you can get at your regular box store. It's flexible uh, L's that you nail into the ground to set the shape and if you want to have a straight line you just leave it alone. If you want to be able to curve it, you cut out these little intersections and bend it to whatever shape you want. Now I've already got two of the lines done and what I'm doing here is I'm setting the back line. So the first thing we did is we determined distance from the wall that this needs to go down. We staked it and put a straight line across so that I don't have to worry about figuring out every single time how far out from the wall I need to be. The other thing I did is I prepped on this corner is I trimmed off the very end over here and that's so it goes it will be able to abut directly up there. Now a lot of what we've been doing today with this is leveling and re-leveling because there was still a bit of a slope and so in this section over here um, what we're doing is we're cutting into the ground whereas at the opposite side we actually had to raise the ground level up. So I've gone in through here and I've scraped this away and what you want to do is set it in place now these things are a little tiny bit warped when you buy them, so not everything will be immediately spot on. And then you line it up with your straight line and you go ahead and set the level on it. And what we're doing here is ensuring that we're running level across the ground. Because if we have each one of these level and we know it's level in between them, we're at the same height all the way. And so this in here, the bubble is reading level. You can double check by running corner to corner, and that's level. And so now that we know this is level, the next thing we need to do is permanently attach it. And so with, the, with these in, in the, the store, they sell plastic stakes that you can use. I'm certain in some parts of the country where the ground is softer, those would work fine. However, where we are, we went out and got big spikes um, from the hardware department. Um, these are normally packaged in, with a coating of grease on them so they don't rust in transit. So when you pick them up, you want to use a glove. You can see my gloves got grease on it. Um, and when you go to the store and buy them, you want to bring a glove with you when you pull them all out because otherwise you'll be coated in grease standing in the store. And so what we do is we set our first spike Make sure everything's butted up correctly. And this has been the story of my day. Every single spike immediately finds a big rock underneath the soil. There we go. And then you want to come down to the opposite end. Make sure you're lined up with your straight line string. And then set your next spike. Now with just the two ends set, you can double check and make sure you're still level. Just make sure not to put your level on the spike heads because they'll throw it off. We're still level. Okay. And you want to make sure you're still lined up with your string. We are still good there. And so with that validated, we can put the rest of them in. I'm putting in four spikes per six foot. These come in six foot lengths. Um, if you need longer than that, you simply put two of them together. Um, in our case, we're doing 15 foot square. And so we're using two of these six foot pieces and then we've got another one we've trimmed in half to three feet and that completes the 15 foot run. Rock. Now again, Check that you're level. Yeah, we're good here. Check that you're level across the corner. And
Okay, yeah, and we're good. Um, now, when you're doing your first row, obviously you don't have a corner to check, so that's going to be your uh, baseline. And what you want to do is you want to pick the flattest one, the one that either requires um, the minimal amount of either lift or excavation. So we did this side first, which was all pretty flat. And then once you've got that in, when you spur off the new side, that's when you use a level across the corners to make sure that both sides are the same height. Now from here, I simply go down to the next section and I'll have to scratch away the soil here, set the next one in place, verify that it's level, uh, spike it in, and then move on to the next one. And so basically you keep doing the same thing. We've got two sides in already. We're doing a third side and then we'll finish with a fourth one. And once we've got that, go through and double check the soil level. Uh, that it's not too high, too low, you know, that you don't you need any more fill, and then we'll be able to start bringing in sand and laying down pavers. Okay, so we've got all four sides done. We've got it all leveled out, and now it's finally the moment of truth. We finally get to put some pavers down. So I've got my sand in here, and what you want to do is you want to screed the sand out so it's all nice and level. Now, a lot of folks use a two by four, that's great, that's fine, that's what you want to do. Um, what I actually like to do is I've got this old level that I use to screed and check for level at the same time. And so we're pulling this down roughly about an inch off here. There we go. And then we're going to start laying in pavers. Now, for an offset look, so to do that, what we did is we cut down a number of blocks in half. These are six by nine, so we cut these down to uh, six by three. And what that allows us to do is build up an offset pattern. Now this corner block is your master one, so when you go, I want to make absolutely sure that it is plumb on level, because everything else will be measured for level based off of this one. Oops. Oh wait. And this sometimes requires a little fiddling, particularly on the first one. Okay, that's dead on. That is dead on. Okay, so we got our next one set. Measure for level there. That's level. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna build out from the corner This is especially important when you've got kind of an offset pattern. And don't just use the level, you want to eyeball them too, because if you've got two bricks like that, and you put the level across it, even though there's a gap in the middle there, it still shows as level. Another tool that a lot of folks like to use when doing this is a rubber mallet to tamp them down. There we go. Yep. And then just start working in from there. So set that oh. 
then And after you've been doing this for a while, you can basically start to look at the sand and know whether or not it's pretty level. Now we're starting at this corner, because this is the corner closest to the house, and it's going to be the most visible section of this when you're not, when you're not actually in the gazebo after it's assembled. Now, as long as you don't push at a funny angle, you can use, you can actually start climbing on this as you go. And she's got varicolored blocks here, so I'm trying to make sure not to put, you know, two of the same color directly next to each other. Now we're starting out another course here, and that's going to require another cut block. The nice thing is, is once you get going with this, it goes quite quickly. And it's wonderful because you, uh, it's a very visceral process. You can see your progress as you go. It's kind of one of those instant gratification jobs. And so, once we've got this corner sort of built out a bit, darker one. The next step will be to then run it all the way down so that we get a clean start all the way across. That's still low. Like I say, after a while you start to get an eye for it. And so, I like to lay down four or five and then start checking for level. And this sand's got a few more rocks in it than I would like. So anything bigger, you know, like a marble size, go ahead and pitch it out of the way. Okay. Check that. That's on. That's on. That's on. So now, now that we've built out this corner, we're basically going to go three bricks deep, either half and hole and hole, or full, three full. And get this all the way down. Also one of those jobs where if you can find yourself an assistant who can keep bricks coming to you as you're working, it's much easier than having to stop and kind of move away for them. No, we wanted that that way around.
And as with most everything we've done, it's basically just a very simple repetitive process done many times. So, in a yellow. And there are, the nice thing about doing pavers is, number one, there are many different patterns you can select. Um, you know, you can do crisscross, herringbone, this sort of offset line pattern we're doing here, uh, and many others. So, the really nice thing is, is you can go out on, online and look at different paver layouts and find the one that you think suits you the most and then set it up. The only, the only real difficult thing about this is if you have to cut pavers because you have to choose whether or not you want to use a, uh, a uh, chisel, um, a brick chisel, which is good on narrower ones but not so good on thick ones, or a chop saw. And I'll be honest with you, the saws are uh, very loud and a little bit dangerous, so it's not something you want to dive into. You want to have somebody show you how to do it and learn how to cut. I'm going to stop for a second. Make sure everybody's level. Oh, that's going to come up a little bit. That's dead on. That's interesting. That's dead on. I don't see any serious gaps. That's dead on. This guy's off. That's what I thought. There we go. problem. This guy wasn't all the way down. I think there's a nail underneath him. There we go. So I'm just going to continue on working my way merrily through this and we'll come back when we've done a bit and show you how the progress is going. So our third Saturday on the project happened to coincide with the Arizona Rare Fruit Growers and Arizona Herb Association's annual plant sale. Now the wonderful thing about this is it's an opportunity to see and buy a number of uh, fairly rare plants that you will never find in a nursery or in a big box store here in Arizona. In addition to this, it's held at the Maricopa County's Cooperative Extension Office and they have a very large uh, demonstration garden here we're walking through their primary you know, kitchen herb garden and in addition to this they have a, a very very nice um, subtropical demonstration garden with you know, bananas, papayas, mangoes, etc. This gave us an opportunity to really show the homeowner the exact depth and breadth of what it is they can plant here. Because when we th start to think about a permaculture environment what we're really talking about is, is not only plants that provide food but a great depth and breadth of plant varieties to either attract pollinators or to provide different types of foods at different times of the years. And what this really gave us the opportunity to do was to show the homeowner exactly how many different varieties they can plant here. Because quite frequently people, in, especially in Phoenix, don't believe that they can grow very much because we're in the middle of a desert. Well, based on the year and timing, this really shows the exact depth and breadth of what can be grown here in Arizona. And uh, it uh, gave our homeowner a, a significant number of ideas for the future for her, in her uh, landscape. So the next big step in our project is to finish stubbing out the irrigation system. We want to get all of this done and plumbed so that we can 
start automatically watering those fruit trees that have been planted. So I'm coming along to all my stubs, trimming them off about a half an inch above the ground. And then we are adding on top a half inch slip to thread adapter. Now, a lot of people probably think this is overkill, but the one thing I've learned over the years after putting these systems in many times is that landscapes change, and sometimes they change quite frequently, especially in a permaculture type environment. You're constantly adding new things in to uh, you know, grow new produce and vegetables and fruits. So by putting this threaded right here, we can then immediately adapt to whatever changes in the landscape without having to excavate down and start over. The other reason why I like to have these really low to the ground is that as we bring in rock after the fact to lay across the yard, we can um, take note of where these are, but then bury them with the rock because PVC breaks down over time with UV light. So if we can protect these from the UV light, uh, it becomes less of a worry and a smaller amount of maintenance. You can also do the same thing when you run the lines out from these. Um, you lay them down and then you put the gravel over top. So the next stage of setting up the watering system is we're going to go ahead and put our electric controller on here. So we've got one of these. It's a basic uh, four valve timer. Fairly simple, easy to use, plugs into the wall. So in the box, there's a template for mounting instructions. And since this is hard stuccoey stuff, we're going to use a uh, fairly heavy duty drill, drill bit. So go ahead and just, based on the template, straightforward. Go ahead and take this template off now. The easy way to put it up is just a little bit of scotch tape. So, wipe it off real quick. Now these, generally speaking, all basically go in the same way. Um, I don't know, sometimes they have four, sometimes it's only, like this one is only three. Get an anchor, press that into the wall. Sometimes it helps to just give it a slight tap with a hammer to get it to flush down. Now the way this particular box is configured, you mount the first screw to the wall. And then it hangs through from behind. And then these uh, you bend this a little bit and generally the plate opens up. Sometimes you have to use a screwdriver or it's screwed down. And then what we're going to do is just go through these bottom two. Um, I just need to go grab a screwdriver. Before I mount this up to the inside of the wall, I wanted to show you what you've got in here. And so this is a fairly, like I said, fairly basic one. You've got an automatic rain sensor you turn on and off. You've got one, two, three, four controls. That's for four valves. And then you can run a number of different things, uh, other things on this, but in our configuration, we're just going to be running the four valves. So uh, at this stage, the other thing I do is I pilot these in. So it makes it easier to mount it up against the wall because they're sticking out just slightly. And you'll be able to position them against.
Okay, here we go. We got it all nicely mounted to the wall. I'm just going to sort of tuck that in behind and through. Now, if you're using these plugged in, you see how this flat waterproof plate will end up staying up. One of the things we're going to have to come along later and get is one of the boxes that actually sticks out from the wall about two inches so that we can plug this in. This will stay shut and waterproof. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to wire this up to the valves. So what I've got here is standard sprinkler wire. It's uh, plastic coated with five wires on the inside, green, orange, white, red, and black. And the way you want to do this is take it and strip the insulation. Do it about well, half an inch or so. And so these are going to get hooked in and be your circuits. One of the things I recommend to folks is when you set all this up, make write down notes of what color wire runs which circuit that way if you have to come over here and mess with things you know you know that uh, number one is green and it runs the lawn so that when you're going to go reprogram your timer you know because it's winter time or because you've added some new plants or something you won't be standing there confused wondering which valve is which Okay. There we go. Go ahead and just feed this up from underneath. Or alternatively set it here and feed it through. And so first one you hook up is your common. Now these are just little levers, so you lift the lever and slide your wire up. And let's see, I guess white will be circuit number one. Green will be circuit number two. Sometimes it helps to have a pair of needle nose pliers to help push the wire up. to the last wire. Now you'll know they're fitted in correctly because you'll pull on them and if they pop out it's not all the way in you need to redo it. Now we take the other end of this feed it down behind here and we're going to run that down to our valve box. Go ahead and shut this. There's no reason to open that again for right now. Go ahead and shut this. Now the other thing is most of these have a key lock on them. With little boys here, we were definitely going to lock this because otherwise they go in, they push buttons, and then the next thing you know, nothing works. Okay, now we're down at the box here. We'll feed our wire in.
wires. Now things are a little tiny bit different down here. So each one of these valves has that black solenoid that we saw before with a pigtail coming off of it. And it shouldn't matter which side you wire it up to. I'm just double checking these ones to make sure that they are not specific. Nope. Okay, so one wire will go to your common ground, your black. The other wire will go to one of the colors. Now, I did not remember to bring all of my supplies to the job site today, so we're just going to sort of temporarily wire these up. What I like to do with these is either, is one of two options. Either wire them up and use wire nuts and then cover the wire nuts with electrical tape to keep the water out, or on a longer term installation, what I actually like to do is bring my soldering gun, solder the connections, cover them with heat shrink, and then shrink it down to keep the water out. In most cases, the uh, basic wire nut configuration is just fine. The other thing I like to do is make sure to use the you know, try to make sure that I'm doing kind of the same alignment on the solenoids. So I'll pick one, you know, standard side of the solenoid to draw, put my common ground on, and the other side of the solenoid to do the power to activate it. And uh, <clears throat> I realize this is rather inelegant looking at the moment, but it will be good enough for us to at least test out our lines and make sure everything works. Because uh, one of the things that I really like to do is um, during the process of putting in all that PVC, you get gunk in the lines. And so the first thing you do before you put all of the final heads on your PVC lines is you activate the valves for about 30 seconds or so and it'll geyser water out and it'll clear all the debris out of the lines because otherwise what happens is when your sprinkler heads come on the little filters underneath get clogged and they become less effective and then you have to take them off clean them out or replace them so now that we've got all this done uh, we can remove the uh, we can go ahead and plug the unit in And there's generally an enclosed battery inside the unit that takes care of things in, in the event of power failure. It makes sure to keep the, uh, keep the program in memory. So you go ahead and pull that out. And it's come on. So I'm gonna go turn on the master water now and uh, we will go ahead and trigger the valves. So after going to the uh, Valley Plant sale earlier today, 
Um, we picked up a couple of more interesting, uh, rarer plants to put in here on the property, you know, aside from the standard trees. Uh, a couple of very interesting ones. A couple of pomegranates to go against the wall. A collection of blackberries and boysenberries. A dwarf banana. And this one, which is particularly interesting, an ice cream bean. And what this does is it grows up as it creates these seed pods that you crack them open and there's white meat on the inside with seeds and you eat the white meat and it actually tastes kind of like vanilla ice cream. So one of the nice things about here in Arizona is you can get some really um, interesting, not quite tropical, but fairly rare plants to plant. And as long as you keep them watered and you manage your shade correctly, you can grow just about anything. So each week, I swear, it's our last serious digging week. And then I remember another piece of the project that requires an epic amount of digging. So these are the posts for our green wall. They're set in concrete, about two foot down, um, and then backfilled with the soil. And we're going to run a four foot field fence across here in two stacks. And that's what's going to allow us to grow the green wall of grapes. Now the nice thing is, is that um, while the green wall is growing, we can use this space for other things. So in through this area until it grows up, we can plant uh, corn, tomatoes, pole beans, in the winter time, uh, snap peas, and any number of other th vertically growing items, cucumbers, squash, what have you. And so this will still put something green in front of this space, if not necessarily all the way to the top, and it will help shade the house. Now, the other thing we finished up today was all, most of the irrigation, with the exception of the soakers for the tree rings. One of the things that I forgot to prep before we came today is you take a, a, a penny and you drill it with a 1 8 inch drill, and you insert that in between the plumbing line and the soaker hose, and what that does is it cr curtails the amount of water that can actually pass through into the soaker. Um, it allows you to, to lower the volume of water coming out of the soaker hose. Number one, it, it protects the soaker hose from popping or exploding, uh, but number two, less water goes through, and so you can much better, knowing that that's the volume you're going to run, you can much better manage the timing of running the soaker hoses. So the ongoing things that we're still kind of finishing up right now, like I said, is the soaker hoses. The, the pavers are ongoing. Um, one of the things that novices learn as they're putting in the pavers is it may look like it's level, but it's really not level. And so there's a lot of laying it down, checking it for level, pulling it back up, readjusting sand. Um, but I don't know, it's five o'clock today, so I think we're done for the day. And uh, we've gotten a lot done. The yard looks more like a proper place now and every day we get to add something else to it.